So what we have here is the famous 1804 dollar, often known as the king of American coins. This coin was produced in 1804, presumably, right? Well, it's got a date, 1804? No, actually, it's got a really cool story because these coins were produced in the 1830s. What had happened was that in the 1830s, the United States was trying to develop its trade connections with the Far East, countries like China and Southeast Asia. To do so, they realized that you had to have gifts. Diplomatic gifts have been traditional all, all throughout history. And somebody came up with the idea, is why don't we have a complete set of U.S. coins that we can give as a gift to the rulers of these countries? So they went out and tried to get these coins. It turns out that the Mint had records that they had made dollars in 1804, so they wanted to include that. They had made $10 coins, and they'd made a whole slew of the complete denominational set. But nobody could find 1804 dollars. So they went and asked the Mint about it, and the Mint said, well, we, we had records for that, but we actually made the 1803 dollar at that time because uh, dyes were expensive to make, so they used up the dyes. But it says, so what happened was, the Mint was asked to produce $1804 in 1835, 36, which they did, and they made these complete sets of coins that could be given to the Sultan of Siam and various other rulers in the region. When they did this, they created an instant rarity. By the 1850s, American collectors had heard of these coins, and they started asking the Mint if they could get copies for themselves. And a Mint director at the time decided to be helpful and allowed a few of these coins to be made. We now know that there are 15 of these coins in existence. Six of the original 18, 1804s that were made for these Mint sets, and then seven of the later copies, plus one unique piece that's at the Smithsonian Institution that was made on a Swiss shooting toller as a test piece for these dies. And that's it, 15 coins. That's why it's called the King of American Coins. And it's got a great story. These things have been all over the world and people love to see them whenever there's a chance to do it. dealer that deals something really interesting and rare, numismatics. It's called Swedish Plate Money. You're going to like this stuff. Well, I'm here in Atlanta for another uh, of the regular midwinter a a shows. I've been attending them most of my life. Uh, started doing shows with my father. Uh, my first a a was back in 1975. So it's been uh, a regular part of my life to do the shows wherever they are uh, across the country. What's the good thing about the American Numismatic Association? Well, always the uh, attendance is always the greatest thing. It uh, brings people from all over the country to come to one spot to see a lot of great coins. Now, how about you've got some, are they coins? Oh my gosh, Swedish plate money. Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, group of Swedish plate money. This piece is a $4 struck in 1721. It's actually from the John J. Pittman collection, uh, which was sold back in 1999. So it has a nice little pedigree. Um, John J. used to keep these under his bed in his bedroom because they were so big and there was no other good place to store them. But uh, occasionally he would use one as a doorstop as well. <laughs> Why did they plate, make Swedish plate money? So there was a number of factors with Swedish plate money, why it was produced. Um, they made denominations from half dollar all the way up to $10 pieces. There was a uh, Privy Council in 1644 uh, first brought up the idea of striking large plates of copper for export. And Sweden had just finished uh, a war with Denmark and they had to pay Denmark one million silver coins. So it depleted Sweden of all their silver, but they had an abundance of copper. So they wanted to export it, trade it for silver, and import the silver to strike their own uh, national currency. So 
1644, they struck about $26,008 plates that were roughly twice the size of this and around 20 pounds apiece. And of all those that were struck, only six survived today. Uh, five of them are dated 1644 and one is dated 1645 because they stopped production in January of 1645. I think four of the six were from sea salvage from shipwrecks and the other two were found buried in the ground. But um, the reason that so many of them uh, uh, were lost is because once they reached their destination they were melted down they were used to make brass and make other things, and and so they, they rarely stayed in their form. Now, the, the half dollar and one dollar pieces were meant to circulate within Sweden as, as actual money, but the larger pieces were only meant for export and, and uh, eventually uh, melted down and, and lost to uh, numismatics. What kind of value for one like this? Um, this piece, which has a nice pedigree, worth about $3,500. You can see good clear dates in all four corners and a good denomination. So often the stamps are irregular and uh, of course anything that sea salvage could have corrosion. All right, walking down the aisles. Tell me your name again, young man. Trey Jones. All right, and are you, how are you involved in coin collecting? I love collecting proof Franklin half dollars and uh, high-grade toned mercury dollars. Right, and you knew me. How do you know me? Um, I watch you on YouTube, though. Oh, do you? Yes. All right, how yes. exciting. Well, we're videotaping as we speak, and I need to get your parents to say it's okay, and we'll have you on our YouTube channel as well. Okay, great. So do you have one of your cool Franklins to show us? I do, yeah. All right. This Franklin is uh, a 54S Franklin with an FBL. It has amazing crescent toning to it. And um, this toning actually comes from um, from the, uh, the mint sets that these coins came in. They had a little bit of sulfur in them and they actually toned up a little bit. Uh, and this one has very, very attractive colors to it. Um, and this coin is an FBL. And um, FBL stands for full bell lines and it's a, it's a nice fresh strike that makes the complete lines of the bell um, on the bottom of the bell. What got you interested in coins? Um, actually it's kind of a funny story. I, I, was, uh, I was getting some cash at the bank and I found a old $20 bill and I did some research and I also found stuff about coins and that, that's really how I got started coin collecting. And what, how old are you and what grade? I'm um, 14 in eighth grade. Yeah, all right. And how about what? How do we get other young people interested in coins? What's the coolest part about coin collecting? The history, the history, really. Um, I think we need to uh, spread the word about coin collecting and how great it is. Well, I can tell you that makes my numismatic career worthwhile. When young people like that who are interested in coins and I've helped them and they come up to me. This is what coin television is all about. And that's what I'm thrilled to helping other young people to get into the hobby. Urshop, hey, you're here at the ANA convention. Why are you coming to this convention? Well, I came because, you know, to take a look around and see all the great coins that they have available and, uh, you know, possibly get these coins graded if I have the opportunity to do that. Yeah? Yes. Okay, and we always ask our collector friends, do you have something really cool to show us? I do. David, I have the uh, 2019 Reverse Proof Enhanced American Silver Eagle. As soon as I get out the box here. <clears throat> well, this is one of the uh, lowest minted, lowest minted uh, eagles that the uh, mint put, put out. Uh -huh. It's uh, at the, the minted numbers uh, a little bit under 30,000. So, and this coin has been doing very well on the secondary market. So where is the best place to find out where these coins are traded? On the internet, eBay. Uh, that's mainly my source, eBay. I, I was fortunate enough to get one from the Mint. Okay. 
Okay. So, so, so what did it issue for, and what's it training for it now? It issued for sixty-five dollars plus the five dollars. Uh, what was it? A shipping fee. Now, uh, a lot of the graded coins you can find out about a little bit about a little bit under two thousand, around two thousand dollars. Yes. Wow. So they they have they're doing very well in the secondary market. And how difficult is it to get it graded? Uh, not really that difficult. I mean, uh, PC, PCGS and NGC had a uh, what they had a promotion where you sent the coin in and you know they, they graded it for you, which was back in uh, when the coin came out of back around October. So, but I've held on to mines. I'm. I think I'm gonna try to get it graded now, just so uh, I can have it. Not for me, because this is what I'm gonna pass this on. Yes. Can you grade it right here at the coin show? Absolutely. They have uh, PCGS and NGC has a booth here where you can come in and have the coin graded, submit it, and have it graded while you wait, which is fantastic. And what's what's the best thing about coin collecting? Oh, the best thing about coin collecting is for me is that there's so many interesting coins that I collect coins from all over the world. So if I see an interesting coin, I'll try to find out how the best way I can go about a purchase. Here. Walking around the floor, we talked to a couple more collectors with some cool coins. One is our old friend Ray Hers, who's a lecturer from FUN and talks about all kinds of exciting numismatics, who found an Indian scent that was really with some cool color. I bought a proof 1889 Indian scent. It's rated MS64 brown. However, the color is a stark cobalt blue. It's an insane color. And it also has contrast, which they call cameo, from the face to the fields. And I'm not, I wasn't looking for it. It totally was a surprise find uh, that found me. How difficult is it to get color like that on an Indian scent? It's, I, it is atmospheric conditions over a century, so it's impossible to put a percentage to it because most coins, they will turn brown over time, and the coins that stay red or pink are much more highly valued. But sometimes when you look for a coin that's turned to a darker color, you find significant price savings and also many times significant beauty. And that's what I found with this surprise coin. And what kind of value? 400. So it compares, if it didn't have that beautiful color, it's probably $100 more than average and I paid up for it. And I've been at this a very long time, so I know when something just feels right, I'm in it. Uh, yes, I have a 1925 um, Double Eagle, which is considered a very common St. Gordon's Double Eagle. Um, and uh, the certified population of these for both combined PCGS and NGC is 108,600. And this is a double die reverse. And there are only 71 certified popula population uh, coins like this for both third party graders. And that's one fifteenth of one percent of the population. That's what I call a scarce coin and an interesting coin. And you can still buy these and other uh, St. Gordon varieties because they're not widely collected for maybe a hundred dollars over melt. And, and you cherry pick that here at the show? Yes, I cherry pick uh, pretty much the common dates, believe it or not, the 22, the 24, the 25, the 26 and the 28 all have varieties associated with them that are overlooked by many people. This is an example of one where the, it's not designated on the label, but both PCGS and NGC recognize the 25 as a um, interesting variety. And if somebody came to a coin show, could they find these coins also? Yeah, I've been cherry picking them for years. Um, there's a new edition of the volume two of the Cherry Picker's Guide coming out next fall. And I, I've been in conversation with Bill Fiva, and I believe they're going to add six St. Gordon's varieties, and this should attract some people's attention. And um, if they're anything like uh, Large Sense or Morgan Dollars, 
you know, who knows? They might become very popular at some point. You know, coins of this rarity in this series are five and six figure coins. And this is, uh, this cost me $1,725, which is less than $100 over melt as of yesterday. Owen, you're, yes, you're here at the American Numismatic Association yes. Coin yes, Show. Why are you here? At, why have you come to this convention? Um, so today I was here to go buy and sell coins uh, and get some graded at ANCAS. Um, and today I bought a coin in 1886 uh, S. Uh, Morgan dollar, and I bought it for eighteen dollars. And uh, estimated value uh, out of what I have seen uh, is about fifty-five dollars. So I'm very happy with that, and I'm very happy with uh, what I've done today. Wow! And how old are you? I'm thirteen years old. Sir. And when did you start coin collecting? <laughs> I started coin collecting about seven months ago. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Who, who helped get you into it? Um. Well, really, my brother. Uh, so he started about two months before me, and I really liked the fact that he started collecting coins too, and I, I started, you know. And who brought you to this coin convention? Uh, my grandfather. What's his uh, name? His name is Martin. All right. Isn't that a good thing about a grandpa? Yeah. All right, and what is it that about coins that got your interest? Uh, what fascinates me about coins is what their value is and like how you sell them and it's all cool about the market and uh, what it's made of and how long it's been like coins have been and dollars and everything that you see here have been around so you know it's a uh, really cool to know that show me something cool all right this is something cool this right here is a is a mock-up of a the LEM, the Lunar Landing Module. And so, what this is, it comes in this really cool box, and and the instructions and about the coin is all in metal. It's kind of like the, uh, the Deep Probe 9 or whatever that did this. And then, if you press the sides, then this, this module opens up. It's kind of slow, but that's okay. I can speed it up if I hold them both at the same time. And then when it opens up, it has these, it reveals these panels. And the coin itself is a colored coin with Earth and the Moon. It's legal tender in the Cook Islands, supposedly. And on the reverse is a high relief panda. So now it's a panda in space coin. And everybody loves pandas. And so this is how it's packaged. And we just think this is an absolute fun, marvelous thing. And, and actually, the packaging comes with the coin and it's really not much more than it would be if you just bought the coin regular and had it certified. So you can buy it with this, or you can buy it in a holder, like there. How much did it cost? Yeah, three three twenty five, three hundred twenty five bucks. Is that pretty neat, or what? Cool.